Oh, it says, it says no. Oh, it's on. I got it, got it. All right, all right. Well, it's good to be saved. Listen, I will mention a couple of things about the book table. And um, somebody asked me one time, they said, uh, don't you have a conviction about money changing in the church? And I said, well, actually, I do. I really do. Fortunately, my wife has no convictions whatsoever. <laughs> that's why she takes care of the book table. Uh, that is actually the first book I wrote. It's called uh, <clears throat> The Understandable History of the Bible. And don't let the size uh, scare you. Uh, it is an understandable history of the Bible. And I was telling you last night, uh, I read about oh, a couple hundred books on this subject over 40 years, some, some years, uh, and uh, most folks don't want to put that much time into it. Uh, and I tell them, if you want a single source, that pretty much covers the subject. So, um, so that, uh, that is back there. I, I tell people, uh, I guarantee it, that book will stop a Bible corrector in their tracks. If you can get them right about the bridge of the nose, that will uh, stop them in their tracks. This one... Uh, let me explain, is, uh, it's called Fight On. This is not about a Baptist business meeting, but um, uh, it, is just, it is just single uh, page stories. Uh, some of them maybe go more than one page, but um, uh, they're single page stories, anything from military situations to uh, you know, everything from the Napoleonic Wars to uh, the one in Afghanistan and uh, recent in Iraq. Uh, there's uh, mountain climbing accidents, uh, plane wrecks, shipwrecks, um, train wrecks. There is Baptist business meetings, I think, because they wanted something really violent and terrible. But, um, oh, grizzly bear attacks, grizzly bear attacks. Uh, and so, um, and all this is, that, now these are not survival stories, because you can survive by just washing up on a beach. Uh, these are stories where people, you know, they, they may have given up uh, or had the opportunity to give up, and they chose not to. And I appreciate anybody that chooses to fight on, uh, and uh, there's two of those. And my wife does some kind of a deal if you buy them both. Uh, I'm not the dealer, so I don't, I don't know what she does. But, um, and then there's this one. Uh, you've heard people say that there are contradictions in the Bible, have you not? Sure. Right? Now, there are no contradictions in the Bible. But um, uh, I believe this. Now, let me, let me explain to you. We've got two pastors here. Uh, and for the benefit of all the church members from whichever church you're from, <clears throat> you know, your pastor is like, uh, he's your pastor, uh, your confidant, your preacher, uh, teacher, friend, there may be any many num number of things that you call him. Let me tell you what your pastor is not. He is not the church hitman. And by that I mean we get these people and they think they can be totally irresponsible uh, about knowing anything uh, about the Bible or about what they believe because I'll just call the pastor if I get stumped and then he'll take care of it. Well, that's not what your pastor is there for. And so although that looks like a, 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 a book, I call that a bullet because that will load your gun. Uh, and that, uh, it, is, uh, it's, it is well written, uh, it is easy to read, and this takes those apparent contradictions that people say, the mistakes in the Bible, uh, that uh, shows that they are not there. Uh, and it may help you, because guys, just let's be realistic. Your pastor can't be with you when you're at work, or when you're at school. You're, you can't always have uh, somebody there with a wealth of Bible knowledge uh, to answer all your questions, and so uh, that book may help you. Uh, this one is, What is Repentance? Uh, that's a narrow little book. I think it's 20 pages, 24 pages, 24, 23. And uh, it is the best uh, explanation I've heard uh, on that subject. So uh, that is out there. Uh, and there's, uh, there's other things. Like I told you, my wife will be out there to, uh, uh, to take care of you. Uh, well, I got you here, I want you to open your Bibles to uh, two places. Uh, I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 24. And I want you to go to Daniel chapter 1. The good news is that this message only has two points. The bad news is, they're, all, they're both about uh, 30 minutes long. But, um, but before I preach, I, wanna, I want to, uh, I wanna ask, your, uh, ask you a favor. Uh, there's a, there's a fellow I met a few years ago now. Uh, his, his name is Kirby Campbell. And Brother Campbell... Uh, he, he was not a friend of mine uh, until this, uh, after this happened, but he was pastoring up in Washington State. Was going in for routine knee surgery, uh, and they gave him a, a, a spinal, and um, they, it, it infected his spine, uh, and that man today is in pain 24 hours a day. Uh, if he were here, if he were talking to you, when he, he, is, he, is, he is always bicycle in his arms and legs like this. He's in so much pain. Um, because of that, he had to uh, 
uh, resigned his church. Uh, he didn't quit. Uh, he's got a thing called Treasured Trials Ministries. Uh, if you go online, uh, there's a, I went online and, and it showed him preaching in this church. The camera's over here. And he's behind the pulpit through the whole sermon. He is just, he is just picking his feet up and, and moving because he is absolutely in pain. Uh, and I'll tell you something, guys, that is hard to endure. And so um, I make a point of every place we go uh, just trying to get somebody uh, that will pray for him. And so uh, if you would remember, Brother Kirby Campbell, uh, I'm not asking you to you know, pray for him every day or any, or any kind of promise, but if you'd pray for him, I'll tell you... Um, uh, you know, I deal with some pain, and, and I get a lot of people when I had this last surgery. Well, not the last one. The last one was two weeks ago, uh, but the one in um, in 08. Uh, and I had somebody ask me, they said, um, <clears throat> they said, how did you get off being addicted to painkillers? And I said, well, I said, that was real easy. I said, I never got addicted to them. Because I don't take a lot of painkillers, but, but I tell people this. I did get addicted to something. I got addicted to your prayers. Now, I know that sounds you know, like, oh, that's a neat spiritual thing to say. I'm not trying to be neat or spiritual. That's really what I got addicted to. Now, let me explain something. If you're addicted to drugs, you can get the drugs. You can get them legally or illegally, but you can get the drugs. Nobody can make you pray. Right? So, so I am at your mercy, all right? And so um, uh, I appreciate you praying for us. And if you would pray for Brother Campbell, uh, I, just, uh, I pray for him every day. And just uh, the word, the, you know, you say, well, let's pray that God will take his pain away. And, you know, after about, uh, myself, after about 40 years of it, uh, you realize uh, in some cases he's not going to take it away. But uh, so you just ask this one magic word, make it bearable. And so uh, pray for Brother Campbell uh, that, uh, that God would make his prayer bearable. Now, uh, I was telling you the other night, I think I did, that uh, Kathy and I, you know, we don't have a house. We do, uh, we do the whole country uh, uh, two years east, two years west. Uh, you know, um, uh, in, the, in the west, you guys laugh at the mountains that they have in the east. You know, out west they go, hey, mountains don't have grass on top of them, you know. <laughs> and, and that's okay, that's okay, because in the east they laugh at your rivers. <laughs> you know, your, your rivers need plumbed, Okay. I mean, I used, you can listen when it's a river and you can jump across it. It's just not much of a river, okay? But um, let me tell you another thing about those two two uh, halves of the country. Uh, in the West, the West has beautiful places. Uh, the East has nothing to compare to Yellowstone. Uh, you go to South Utah, you got Zion Canyon, Bryce Canyon, uh, Carlsbad uh, Caverns. Uh, the, the 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 West has beautiful places. The East has what we call points of interest. Um, we have been to Plymouth Rock. You got nothing like that out here. I have been uh, um, uh, uh, on the uh, on the decks of Old Ironsides, USS Constitution. Uh, we have been there at the North Church where they hung the two lights uh, the night the British invaded. Uh, we have been to Gettysburg, and so so the East has uh, these pla- these points of interest. The West has has uh, places that are beautiful, but there's a point of interest in the West that that every American ought to go by and see. And that is uh, the Alamo. That's in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and what happened is, you know, uh, Texas was uh, rebelling against uh, being under Mexican authority. Uh, and, um, and the Mexicans came uh, and, they, and they ran the Texans out. So the Texans came and ran the Mexicans out. And, uh, and, and the, the uh, Mexican army uh, said they're going to they, they come and take it again. And that's the, that's the famous battle. It's actually the second battle of the Alamo. Uh, and Santa Ana started uh, marching his army of 5,000 men toward the Alamo. Uh, and in that Alamo was only 180 guys. And the head guy uh, that, was, uh, that was running that was a fellow by the name of Colonel Travis. And Colonel Travis put out the word uh, that uh, he put out a letter to three people. He put out one to Sam Houston, uh, to uh, Stephen Austin, uh, and to uh, a Colonel Fanning. Uh, and he asked those guys, you have to forgive me, I'm getting a cold, but... Uh, uh, he asked those guys to come and send him some troops to relieve him. And, uh, and he got one by one the response is that nobody was coming. Uh, Colonel Fanning uh, may have helped him, but he just chose not to. Uh, Austin and Houston didn't help him because they hadn't had time to get their armies together. They really had nobody to, uh, to, uh, to, to show up at the Alamo with. And so with that, uh, that known, it is obvious that everybody stays in the Alamo is a doomed man. And so Colonel Travis took those 179 men. He stood them outside uh, the Alamo. Now, the Alamo at that time was outside the city. If you ever go to San Antonio, it's, now, it's downtown now. And, um, 
And they say with this back to the Alamo, uh, he explained to his men that uh, there was going to be no relief. There's going to be nobody coming, uh, no troops coming to help him. Uh, there actually were some that came from Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, Davy Crockett, the, the famous uh, frontiersman, came. And, um, but there was going to be nobody to really help these guys, and to stay there was, was, was going to be death. And he told those men this. He said, now, <clears throat> he said, it's my job to defend this, uh, this, this place, this Alamo. And he said, I am going to go in and do my job. But he said, every one of you men are free to go. If you leave today, no one will call you a coward. You are free to leave. And then he walked down to the end of that line. He took his saber uh, out of his scabbard. He put the tip of it down in, the, in that Texas soil. And he began to drag it, uh, draw a line, which, which went down in history as the line in the sand. And he drew that, that line down in front of those 179 men. Uh, and he said, now men, he said, uh, uh, I tell you that if you leave today, Nobody's going to call you a coward. Uh, but he said, I have not been relieved of my duty, and I'm going to go, uh, and I'm going to take my stand in the Alamo. And he said, any man that chooses to stay, any, any man that chooses to go, you can go. Any man that chooses to stay with me, step across that line. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how many young people we've got here uh, that, that may, this may help. You know what I'm afraid of? Uh, Twitter and texting uh, and all. I'm not, I'm not down in earth. You know what I'm afraid? I'm afraid we've got a generation that can't make a decision unless they bounce it off a half a dozen people. I, you know, how did these guys do this? 179 guys. You think, oh, oh let's see, am I going to stay? Uh, are you staying? You know, eight people down. Are you going to stay, Bill? Uh, well, hey, listen, uh, you folks in, uh, in Albuquerque, uh, uh, here's our situation. Uh, how many of you think ought to stay? <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to shut the phone off and make a decision. Right. And without any consultation or Twitter or texting or anybody to, you know, uh, any uh, uh, network uh, to help them, 179 men in unison stepped across that line. They stepped across that line, they stepped back in the Alamo, and they walked into the annals of history. Uh, Santa Anna came in, by the time he got there, uh, by the time this was over, his, uh, his, um, his rank swelled to 10,000 men against 180 Texans. And, uh, and for 11 days... He attacked that Alamo and, and could not carry it. On the, on the 12th day, they finally breached the wall. Uh, and he was flying the red flag, which meant there was no quarter given. And no matter what they, if you try to surrender, they're going to kill you anyway. And so um, on the 12th day, they breached that wall. Uh, and everybody that wasn't dead, they killed. Now, I know what you're going to say. Some people say, well, that was a waste of life. No, that was 11 days that changed the history of the world. See, here's what happened in that 11 days. In that 11 days, Sam Houston and, and um, uh, uh, Stephen Austin got their armies together, and they met later, they met uh, uh, Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto and, and defeated him. Texas became a free, its own sovereign state in uh, 1835, and about, I believe it was, or 36, in 1846, they became one of the United States. In that 11 days, that helped Texas to become free, and then they joined the United States. Uh, I think it absolutely changed world history. But here's what that, that all started with. That all started with a line in the sand. And I'm going to talk to you about two lines tonight, okay? Now, he told those guys, there's the line, and if you want to join me, cross it. And they had the option to cross it and not to cross it. Uh, and that's what you do with lines. I mean, that's, everybody, you see a line? You, you, hey, don't go cross that line. And some folks don't cross it, some folks do. I'm going to talk to you about the first line that, that maybe you need to get across it. And the second one, maybe you need to draw one so that uh, you don't cross it. Now, I want you to look here in uh, 2 Samuel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, <clears throat> what's going on here is there's a, uh, uh, a famine in the land. And it's been going on for three days. 70,000 people die. You imagine anything happening in this country where 70,000 people died in three days? Now, that would be a, that'd be a tragedy for this country, would it not? But we've got 325 million people. What do you think it is for 70,000 people to die in a country of only about 2 million people? There was probably hardly a family that either lost, didn't lose somebody or at least know someone uh, who died in that famine. And it says this, verse uh, 18. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, uh, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, uh, went up as the Lord commanded. And Runa looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Runa went out uh, and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. 
And Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king, uh, my, yeah, my lord the king, come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Aruna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer what seemeth good to, uh, unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, uh, and threshing instruments and, and uh, other instruments uh, of oxen, uh, of the oxen for wood. Now, let me stop for a second. Guys, I'm a King James Bible believer. I don't change it. I don't update it uh, or anything else. But, but I'm going to update verse 22 just for you guys. Because I'm not sure you understand what he just said. So, uh, so let's read verse 22 again. And, uh, and this time it's happening in 2013. And Ruth said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here is my John Deere articulated tractor. Burn that. Uh, and here's my combine and my baler uh, and all of the implements that go with my John Deere. Burn those too. Guys, isn't that what he just said? You know, they, I, I'm, I'm not a farmer. But in those days, the guy literally, uh, he'd either push a, uh, uh, push a little plow, kind of like pushing your rototiller without starting it. Or, or, or he'd hook himself to the plow uh, and he'd pull it. And then this guy would get some money and he'd get him an oxen. But they tell me this. If a guy got two oxen, that was all the oxen you needed. You didn't have three or four or six or eight. Uh, you, to plow, you just needed two guys. And if you had two oxen, you might have four where you'd put two on. And when those guys got tired, you put two more on. But if you had a team of oxen, you were a rich farmer. This guy had oxen. And here's what he just told David. You can take all of my wealth and make me a poor man. Kill my oxen burn the plow, burn all of the farming implements. Do you understand this guy was, was willing to put himself out of business? The only reason I say that is I want you to understand what this guy offered to give up on behalf of his king uh, and the people of Israel. Uh, verse uh, 23, All these things did Aruna as a king give unto the king. And Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I, will not, uh, but I will surely buy it of thee uh, at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord of my God, which doth cost me nothing. Now guys, I always say it this way. Verse 24, you know what it is? That is a proof text that David was not a Baptist. <laughs> because a Baptist, you know, they're going to find a way to give something that is not theirs. <laughs> You know, like when Saul, remember 1 Samuel 13, uh, 15, and Saul went in there and he killed all those, uh, those Amalekites, uh, but he kept some of the sheep, and he said, well, we kept these to offer to God. What do you mean, man? That would be, like, be like you walking up to some guy and shooting him and taking his wallet and then bringing it in here uh, and put it in the offering. <laughs> now, I'd accept that. <laughs> I might as well let you know, you know, if you get tempted, I mean, I'd take that, but uh, God wouldn't be too excited over it. And so, uh, David, he said, you know what he said? He said, he said, I'm, you, and we do this. We put a line. We put a line between us and doing something for the Lord. And he said uh, he wasn't going to offer anything that didn't cost him, that cost him nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. <laughs> and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the, hand, uh, for the land uh, and the plague was stayed from Israel. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father. Now, we thank you now, God, for your goodness, for your grace, for your great kindness. Lord God, these folks, uh, they're loyal to you. They really are. They're faithful to you, especially these folks that aren't even from this church that would come. They could have been doing something. But the fact is, God, that Monday's not a church night, which means every person here has something that they're usually doing about 6.30 on a Monday night. And every person here tonight told you that they would rather be in church than do what they usually do. So God, I pray that you are blessed by the attendance of these people. I pray that these people are blessed for their attendance. Now God, you know all the things about me that would prevent this message from being preached. And God, I don't want anything to, uh, to, to draw away from the message. So God, please uh, get Sam Gipp out of your way and get him out of the way of these people and accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Now, the first line I'm going to talk to you about is the line you need to cross. You know what that cross is, that, that one is? That's between you and doing something for God. Here's what David, here was David. He wanted to, to stop this plague, but it's going to cost him something, wasn't it? Now, there was a way he could have got out of, not, uh, of it costing him something. He could have just taken Aruna uh, and the deal that Aruna offered him and said, Yeah, man, that's such a great idea. That's the Baptist preacher in all of us. 
You hear this. How many times have you heard somebody got something free, and instead of saying, boy, isn't that great, you kind of said in your heart, how do I get in that line? <laughs> and we all want to know. You heard the joke, you know, where uh, uh, this, uh, this Jewish guy got a haircut, and uh, he got done. He went to pay the barber, and the barber said, uh, nope. He said, sir, he said, I never take money from a man of cloth. And he said, well, thank you. Thank you, son. That's really nice. And he came back, and next morning went to open up his barber shop. There's a great big bouquet of flowers, and it said from the rabbi. Uh, he said, you know, appreciate the haircut. And the next, that day, a Catholic priest came in, and he got ready to pay him. And he said, no, no. He said, I never, never take anything from a man of the cloth. Well, he said, well, thank you, son. That's nice. And he said he came there the next day, and he said there was a bottle of wine from the Catholic church. Now, I'm not a wine drinker, but he's a barber. And, um, uh, and he said that day, a Baptist preacher came, and he's about to pay him. And, uh, and he says, no. He says, Reverend, I never take anything from a man of the cloth. He said, well, thank you. That's really kind. He came next day to open up his barber shop. There were 30 Baptist preachers looking for haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what? How do I get something for nothing? That's what we all think. Isn't that right? But David said this. He said, I am not drawing a line between me and doing something for God. Let me give you a couple of areas where you don't want to draw a line. Now, one of these you don't need too much of, uh, considering where you are and when it is. But I tell people this. Don't draw a line between Sunday morning and Sunday evening services. Now, um, uh, I've been in some churches, you know, you get these people, they come Sunday morning, uh, and they never show up for Sunday night. Hey, guys, don't draw a line. And you say, well, uh, I, you know, I think you get enough. I don't. Yeah. I really don't. I don't think anybody's ever going to OD on preaching. Right, right. All right? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't come up on Sunday morning and not come Sunday night. Now, some folks come Sunday night and don't come, to, don't come again. You might have some folks that showed up here Sunday morning, and you won't see them until next Sunday morning. Or they showed up Sunday morning and last night and you won't see them again until next Sunday. Because uh, I, I did my duty. No, I show up for Sunday morning and come to midweek service on Wednesday night. But you got folks who come Sunday morning and Wednesday night faithfully. But they never come to an extra service. They won't show up on Monday. They won't show up on Tuesday. Won't, they won't be here on Thursday or Friday or anything like that. They'll be there Sunday. They'll be there Wednesday. And they'll go, I'm doing my duty for God. Uh, I was preaching at this church one time, not, not too many years ago, uh, and I can still remember this. It was a Tuesday night. Just walked in, uh, and just before service, this young guy walks up to me, and he is just beaming. He is all excited. And he said, uh, he said it's good to be in church tonight. I said, well, yes, it is. And he said, he said you know, it's amazing that I'm, in church. I'm here tonight. Now, let me explain something, guys. I'm a writer, and, uh, and you've got to beware of exaggerating. <laughs> now, me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't exaggerate in a million years. But, um, and so, you know, I think amazing is kind of a strong word. I mean, kids in church, it's, I, I don't know that it's amazing. And I said, well, I said, I'm sure it's great that you're in church. It's good that you're in church. I don't know if it's amazing. He said, no, no. He said, it's amazing that I'm in church. I said, um, I said, why is it amazing that you're in church? This is the next thing he said. Now, these are his words. He said, I am addicted to lost. Now, if you don't know what Lost is or was, I don't know if it's still on TV, but Lost was some kind of a program where I never saw it, but I, but I saw the advertisements. This plane crashes onto a deserted island where there's nobody on this island except the people from this plane and everybody that's not in this room. I mean, there must have been 18 million people on this island from what I'm seeing on the advertisements, you know. And, um, and I, I looked for it one time, but I can't find it. Apparently, it's um, Lost. And so, uh, but he said, he said, I am addicted to Lost. He said, I've seen every episode. I've got every episode on DVD. And he said, I never miss it. And he said, it's on tonight at 7 o'clock. And he said, I, he said, now look, I got saved three months ago. And he said, since I got saved, I only ever came to church on Sunday morning. He said, I came faithfully, but I came Sunday morning. He said, I came Sunday morning this week. I came back Sunday night. I was here last night. I'm here tonight, and I'm going to be here tomorrow. And he said, when I was walking out uh, of the house tonight, he said, my brother says, uh, where are you going? He said, I'm going to church. My brother said, lost is on. He goes, yeah, I know. He goes, but I'm going to church. And then he said this, you want me to record it for you? And I said, no. And I said, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Here's what happened. All those, all those three months, you know what he'd been doing? He'd been coming Sunday morning, and he drew a line between any extra services. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't coming Sunday night. He wasn't going to come Wednesday night. He was going to come Monday or Tuesday, but he, he crossed that line. Guys, I'm going to say it again. You're not going to be in church too many times. You are just not going to OD on church. 
Don't draw a line between you and church services. Don't draw a line between a pittance and a tithe. You say, what's a pittance? Anything under a tithe. And a tithe is 10% off the top. Now, let me tell you what a tithe is not. When you tithe, tithing is not giving to God. You know why? Because you can't give somebody that which is already theirs. If somebody hands you $10, you've already got a dollar. I talked to a guy one time and he goes, I can't afford to tithe. I said, oh, you've got nothing. Well, yeah, I got something. I said, well, then you can afford to tithe. <laughs> Guys, if you've got $10, don't you have a dollar? If you've got $100, don't you have $10? If you've got $1,000, don't you have $100? If you've got $10,000, don't you have $100? <laughs> I mean, isn't that about where the we knees get weak? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm making too much to, to tithe now. God's blessed me too much. But look, I see people, you know, I've seen this happen. They'll be offering, they'll, they'll be passing off for a plate, and Brother So and so, you know, man, he'll pull them out a hundred dollar bill, and he'll kind of wave it so everybody can see it, and he'll drop it in the offering plate. And everybody will go, Wow, did you see, see so brother so and so? He put a hundred hundred dollars in the offering. You know what you don't know? He owes he's he's five hundred dollars behind on tithe. <laughs> You think he's making a big deal about giving God a hundred bucks. No, he's making a big deal about stealing 400. <laughs> now, guys, you ought to tithe. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, it's not giving. Tithing is giving. Is just Here's what it is. It's not giving to God. It is getting God's money out of your wallet. You know what I don't want God to do? I don't want God to do an inventory on my wallet and find any of his money in there. Yeah. And I personally think he's got the serial numbers memorized. <laughs> so, um, so, guys, I think you ought to tithe. I'll tell you what else I believe about tithing. Uh, I had this happen. Uh, this, uh, this lady sent us a check one time. And, uh, and it was nice, you know. She had my name spelled right, which was remarkable. And she had a nice amount there. And then right down there where it said memo, it said tithe. Now, you know what I had to do with that check, don't you? Yeah, when I was down at the bank to cash, I had to hold my thumb over the word tithe. <laughs> <clears throat> so I felt no conviction whatsoever. Well, it worked. But um, no, I, I sent that back to her, you know. And I said, ma'am... I said, I appreciate you wanting to send us something. Uh, and I said, I, you know, I didn't scold or anything. I just said, uh, I, I don't believe your tithe belongs to anybody but your local church. I believe if you're a member of this church, your tithe belongs here. Uh, you folks from Lighthouse, your tithe belongs there. Listen very carefully. I am an evangelist. I don't want your tithe. I uh, want the other 90%. <laughs> Come on, guys. I know what you got left. But... Uh, <laughs> But don't draw a line between a pittance and tithing. Anything you give less than that 10%, you're going in a hole. Now, if you are a tither and you meticulously give 10%, you take that 10% and you get it put in that offering so that you don't have any of God's money, I have got good news for you. You are not a thief. But you know what some folks do? They start tithing, but they never give. You know, if all you do is faithfully tithe, all that means is that you don't have any of God's money in your wallet, but you've got all the yours in your wallet. And there's a time when you just need to give something that is yours. Uh, and so um, maybe you need to cross over from tithing to giving. The Bible says that it's more blessed to give than receive. If all you do is tithe, you never give, you don't know how, what a blessing that is. And I know you say, you say, well, preacher, you're saying that so you get money. I am not saying that so I get money. In fact, I was preaching in Ohio some years ago, and I was talking about giving. Uh, and I told those people what I'm going to tell you. Uh, if you think, uh, well, while I'm talking about giving, that uh, you need to give somebody money, don't give it to me. Give it to somebody else. Uh, go in this room over here or go out here, go right out here and read some of them uh, missionaries. Send it to them. I made that statement. And after church, this guy walks up to me and he said, while you were preaching about giving, God laid it on my heart to give somebody $1,000. Who do you think I ought to give it to? And I said, Have you seen my family? <laughs> We've eaten once this month. I hope we'd again. I told him, I said, I said, go to the mission board, and before you start reading mission letters, say this. Tell God in prayer, God, I'm going to give one of these missionaries $1,000. Tell me which one. I said, if you look at all the missionaries your church supports, and God doesn't tell you to send, send one of those missionaries that money, I said, come back and see me. I know some missionaries that are on that board. I'll tell you about some of them. Maybe you want to send it to them. I said, if God doesn't have you send it to them, you ready for this? I said, give it to your pastor. You know what you told me to tell? Yeah, right. 
and, and two weeks in Hawaii. Anyway, um, hey, you know what that guy did? That guy gave that $1,000 to, to some missionary. I've known that guy for years. As far as I know, he's never given me $1,000. <laughs> never given me $1,000. <laughs> but you know what that was? He crossed from tithing into giving. And so, guys, don't draw a line between tithing and giving. Cross that line. And I'm telling you, there is no blessing. There is no blessing like giving like that. Now, some people are tithers. Some people are givers. But then there's another step. You know what it is? It's called sacrificial giving. You say, what's the difference between giving and sacrificial giving? Uh, my wife and I support 26 or 27 missionaries. I can't remember which exactly. Uh, and, um, and to be honest with you, we budget that. That's just giving. We just do that. But every now and then we hear about a church trying to buy a building or somebody having a problem. We send them some money. You say, well, we're, you must have a lot of money. I well, no, would if we didn't support them stinking missionaries. <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, guys, that sometimes somebody needs some money and the only way to give it is for you to, to hurt when you give it. Now, for some of you, I know we're back to tithing. But um, <laughs> <coughs> let me tell you what happened. Uh, I was pastoring in upstate New York, you know. Uh, I'm sitting in the office one day. Uh, and, a, and a preacher friend of mine in Ohio called me up, uh, and he said, I got a preacher here that I want you to pray for. Like I mentioned Kirby Campbell to you, uh, he mentioned the pastor. Uh, and I said, well, sure, what's the problem? And I said, well, this guy pastors a Baptist church here in Ohio. And he said, the people are mad at him, and they're trying to starve him out. They're just not giving, they're not tithing, they're just trying to starve this guy out. And he said, pray for him that, uh, that he gets some money. And I said, okay. So I hung up, and I turned around, I got on my, on my knees at my chair, and I began to pray. And I said, God, send that guy some money. Now, prior to that, I'd been saving up a little money to take my wife out to eat. I saved up a hundred bucks to take my wife out to eat. You say, you need a hundred bucks? You ought to see my wife eat. <laughs> you ought to hear my wife eat. But anyway. <laughs> and my wife didn't know I had this hundred bucks. You know, I got this hundred dollars. I'm going to take, take her out to eat. So I'm on my knees and I said, God, I said, send that man some money. And the Lord said, uh, why don't you send him some money? I wasn't trying to make it too personal, you know. But, uh, but I forgot about the hundred bucks. And I said, God, I said, I don't have any money to send him. I said, I'm a Baptist preacher. You know we don't have any money. He said, you got a hundred bucks. I said, that's right, I do. So I sent him the hundred dollars. Now, let me explain about this. Uh, before I send him this money, see, I know preachers. Now, let me say something. And again, I, I don't know Brother Johnson well, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, uh, well, three preachers. But, uh, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to include him because I believe he's a Baptist preacher like every other Baptist preacher I know. And people badmouth preachers about being money grubbers and all this other stuff. Let me tell you the truth about preachers. If a preacher needs money, a pastor, if he needs money and he gets money and somebody in his church needs money, he'll pass that money to that person in his church, hurts family. They'll all do that. I'm telling you all three of these guys, well, I know they will. I, I need money. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Just throw that out there. But... Um, and so, so I, you know what I want to do? I'm going to send this guy 100 bucks. I don't want him giving it to somebody's church. So I made it a designated offering. Now, I don't know who came up with the idea of the designated offering. That's where you give it and tell them how to spend it. That ranks right up there with the Chinese buffet. That was a good idea. <laughs> and so I sent him this letter. And I said, uh, I said, brother, I said, I'm saying this money. And I said, here's what I want you to do with it. And I know he's going to tithe it, which gives him 90 bucks. I said, I am designating this money for a particular purpose. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your wife and take her out for a nice meal to a restaurant. And all joking aside, nobody, I'll, if two people can eat $90 worth, they're going to have to confess it, all right? <laughs> so I know there's going to be something left over. So I said, I said, now after you take your wife out to eat, then I want you to go and take, take and buy your wife a new dress. Now I know what some of you think. You think, oh, you didn't know him, but you knew his wife. No, I didn't even know her name. No, I didn't. I didn't know anything about her. Well, I did know something about it. You know what I knew? Let me tell you what I knew about this preacher who I have never met, I've never seen, I've never spoken to. And I, you know what I knew about him? He's going to get through this. You say, how do you know? Because he's a man. He may go out behind the barn and shake his fist at heaven and say some things that tomorrow he has to go back out behind the barn and apologize for. He may go off in the woods and cry like a baby, but he'll dry his eyes. He's going to come out of that woods and he is going to get through this because he's a man. But I don't know if she's going to get through it because it's harder on the pastor's wife. It is always harder on the preacher's wife, the pastor's wife, than it is on the pastor. And so I thought, if we can get her through this, he's going to get through this, 
and maybe they'll do all right. So I sent him this hundred bucks. And uh, now my wife and I didn't get to go out to eat. But uh, about, about a week later, I got a, I got a letter from him. And he thanked me for the $100. But here's what he said. He said, uh, he said I appreciate you sending $100 because we really need it. But then he said this. He said, but the real blessing was your offering came on December, or no, no, on April 18th. Well, April 18th is only three days late for taxes. I don't know what April 18th is for anybody, you know. And so I'm, I'm thinking, well, what's the big deal about April 18th? He said, April 18th is our wedding anniversary. And he said, this year, because of the problems in the church, I didn't have any money to take my wife out to eat or buy her a dress for our anniversary. Now, I'm about to say something that everybody here, you are going to be so glad you came to church tonight. I'm I'm telling you, I am going to say, you are going to be so glad. Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Between now and next Monday, seven days, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your favorite store. Guys, Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, AutoZone, ladies, Hobby Lobby, <laughs> Joanne Fabrics. Man, I make myself sick. Let me get back around. Anyway, anyway, I want you to go to your favorite store and spend $100 on yourself. Anything you want up to $100, bucks, buy it for yourself. Aren't you glad you came? Because now you can blow 100 bucks on yourself and say, oh, well, you always tell me to do what the preacher said. I'm just doing what the preacher said. <laughs> Listen, in the next seven days, go spend $100 on yourself. Just know this. You will never get the joy spending $100 on yourself that I got spent $100 on somebody else sacrificially. You know what's sad? Your preacher, you know, these pastors probably get up on a Wednesday night, maybe a Sunday night, and they read a mission letter, and here's this missionary. He needs $100 bucks or $200. Bucks, and you know what happens? God tells some, somebody out in the, in, in the congregation, send him that $200. Bucks. And you know what we do when God tells us to do that? You, the first thing you say is, I ain't doing that. Second thing you do is, but how do I still look spiritual? So you go, Pastor, I think we ought to take an offering for him. Yeah. Oh, you sorry thing. <laughs> yeah, okay, so give your $20, but you're missing the blessing, guys. And so, so don't draw a line between a pittance and tithing, or tithing and giving, or giving and sacrificial giving. Hey, guys, don't draw a line being, between being a Bible believer and being a Bible reader. I told you, I don't understand the concept of people that say they believe the Bible and don't read the Bible. Now, if you have a Bible reading program, I don't care what it is, read, you know, a, a chapter here in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament and, and one someplace else in Psalms and one in Revelation. Do anything you want. If you've got some kind of a system that gets you to read every word, then go on and do it. <laughs> but if you don't, let me, uh, let me give you a, uh, some advice. I think you ought to read a proverb for the date. Today is the 4th. You should read Proverbs 4. Tomorrow's the 5th. You ought to read Proverbs 5. Uh, next day's the 6th. I think you can get this. Yeah. Now, now, let me explain it because I know you're Baptist and you're, you're crooked. Um, that means on February 28th, you read 28, 29, 30, and 31. Okay, that doesn't mean you skip three. But read a proverb for the date. That puts you through your Bible 12 times, the book of Proverbs. That puts you through the book of Proverbs 12 times a year. And that puts the book of Proverbs through you 12 times a year. And then there's no, now here's the two words, valid excuse. There's no valid excuse why the adults in this room, I'm exempting the kids, there's no valid excuse why the adults in this room can't read a minimum of 10 pages of their Bible every day. 10 pages? You're going to read 10 pages? Yeah, you know that book you love? Right. That book you claim you believe came from God? Yeah, that book. <laughs> you mean I got to read the names? Listen. The only words you got to read are the ones that are inspired. You say, which ones are those? Open that book, every single one of them. All right? You know, I don't understand the concept of shooting your mouth off about believing the Bible came from God, and then you're going to have to stand in front of the author of this book and explain to him why you never read every word. I was talking to a guy named Mike one time. Mike was a King James Bible believer. Isn't that good? And Mike didn't think he had to read it. Now, now to me, that's like believing in steak and not eating it. I mean, I'm a believer in steak. I believe in the four food groups. Beef, chicken, pork, fish. And um, if I get them all on the buffet at one time, I am really happy. But, um, but guys, uh, it's one thing to you know, believe in steak, and it's another thing to say, eat it. And the thing about believing the Bible, and then you don't read it, if you read 10 pages of your Bible a day, that'll put you through the average Bible three to three and a half times a year. 
When I say that, I get these looks like, you mean when I get done reading it, I gotta read it again? <laughs> yeah, you know that book you love? That book that you, keep, you think came from God? You know why you have to read your Bible and then 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 read your Bible? You know why you have to read your Bible over and over and over again? Because I like to kiss my wife. Well, that's the reason. You need to read your Bible over and over because I like to kiss my wife. Uh, last October 12th, my wife and I celebrated 41 years of being married. I don't know how many times. What did I say? Did I say October? We changed the date. I said, August 12th. What's your name again? You're kind of cute. You got a ride home? Anyway, um, <clears throat> Um, August 12th, August 12th, 1851. Anyway, um, last August 12th, we celebrated 41 years being married. Now, I don't know how many times I've kissed my wife in 41 years, except not enough. I have never kissed my wife yet. They weren't. Okay, that's enough of that right there. I mean, handshake from here on out. Come on, guys, what do you like to do? You, you find a guy that really likes to golf. Hey, man, did you go golfing? Yeah, sure did. How many times did you go golfing last year? <laughs> one. <laughs> I thought you liked golfing. Oh, man, I love golfing. Well, I think one's enough. I don't want to overdo a good thing. Isn't that funny? If you like to do it, you want to do it over and over and over. When it comes to the Bible, if you barely get through it once, you can isn't that enough? No. Right. No, it's not. Amen. Don't draw a line between believing the Bible and reading the Bible. Uh, I read 30 pages of my Bible every day. Uh, in this one, this, uh, this gold ribbon is the Proverbs. So I read my proverb, and I read 20 pages of the Old Testament. That's the red ribbon. 10 pages of the New Testament. That's the blue ribbon. Uh, 30 pages a day puts me through it every 45 days. Uh, puts me through it eight times a year. Uh, I don't do that to find new sermons. If you've heard me preach very long, you know that's true. Uh, and I don't do it to find something nobody else found. I do it. You want to read the reason I do it? to suppress the wickedness of the most wicked individual I have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, there's a chance there's somebody in here more wicked than me. <laughs> oh, anyway, anyway. I mean, just a chance. But, uh, Thank you. but if you're more wicked than me, I'm out of here Thursday, guys. But I'm taking me with me. And if anybody knocks me out of the ministry, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be me. I need to suppress the wickedness of Sam Gibb. And so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do well just to believe a book that I'm not reading. Guys, don't draw a line between believing the Bible and reading the Bible. Don't draw a line between believing the Bible and reading the Bible and not studying the Bible. Now, men say this. Now, now, now ladies, I'm going to say something, and don't, don't tune me out because I'll, 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 I'll make this good. Women say some stupid things. Usually it's, I do. But anyway, <laughs> women say some stupid things, but men say some stupid things. And I don't think that women say things that are more stupid than men, or that men say things that are more stupid than women. But there is a difference. You know what the difference is? When a woman says something stupid, it's, it's usually so evident, and everybody just kind of laughs about it, you know. Uh, I was talking to this uh, preacher's wife one time, and, and she was indignant. She said, well, he wrecked our car, and the next day I wrecked our van, and the next day they canceled our insurance. And I said, well, you think they saw a trend? <laughs> and she was, oh, you, you know. I mean, when a woman says something stupid, everybody just laughs, and, and that's it. When a man says something stupid, he thinks it's oracle. He thinks it ought to be etched in granite and memorized by children. Only a man can say something stupid, and then go, huh? <laughs> and here's what I get from men I tell them read the Bible and they go well, I was reading my Bible every time I read my Bible then I start studying my Bible and then I end up studying it and I don't read it that is stupid <laughs> look you put a stake on a table in front of me you know what I am not going to do I'm not going to study it I am not going to pick up that plate and go ooh look at the cut Look at the grain. Oh, is this a Hereford or a Black Angus? It's a dead cow. And if you don't start cutting and chewing, it died for nothing. But I'll tell you.
tell you what I did. I was interested. I was interested. In all, now, look, I can figure out where some of them parts come from. Ribs. Even rump roast. I can figure that one out. I, but brisket. Where can anything that tastes that good come from? And I found out where it was. And I, I got this book, and it had that dotted line cow where all the parts, you know. Now, I didn't eat the picture. <laughs> but I studied it. So I, I eat steak. I don't have to study it every day. I think you need to read your Bible every day. I don't think you necessarily have to study your Bible every day, but I do think you ought to study some. Amen. You know, I'm a car guy. I like cars. And, and you give me the time, I could probably start with the 265 in 1955, the Chevy first small block V8 uh, that they built. And I could probably tear the cubic inch of every V8 that Chevy ever built that they put in their cars from a factory. Well, you say, you couldn't do that, right? But you could tell me something about what you do or what you like or some football player in his career. I don't have any problem with that. I only have a problem if you know that kind of stuff, but you don't know any Bible. Shame on you. Shame on you if all you're going to do is put stuff in your head uh, about this world and nothing in your head about that book. I'll tell you what I was doing one time. I was, uh, I was in Bible college, and I was working at this, uh, I was, we were building houses, and I was a painter. And I'm in this room about the size. It was a family room, a den. Uh, and I'm in there finishing off this room, and the electrician's up here. He's standing on a ladder, and he's putting in a roof, uh, a ceiling fan. And so it's just him and me in this house. And so I, I looked over at him. He's about two rungs up this ladder. And I said, hey, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you go to heaven? He just stopped working and looked at me. He said, I sure do. I said, are you saved? He said, I sure am. I said, you've accepted Christ? He said, I have. I said, boy, that's really good. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you'd go to heaven? Now, guys, I'm not offended by that question. I'm just not sure why somebody would ask it if you just ask them. I mean, what's he think I'm going to say? No, I just want to see who's going to be in hell with me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll miss you. Uh, and he said, if you died right now, do you know, in fact, you go to heaven? I said, uh, I said, I sure do. He said, you saved? I said, I sure am. He said, now, wait a minute. He said, by saved... I mean, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and had the, had the baptism of the Holy Ghost and had the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Because if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not saved. I said, no, kid. He said, no, kid. I said, okay. I said, let me ask you another question. I said, now, you don't have to give me these exactly right. You don't have to give me the exact book, chapter, and verse. You don't have to quote the verses exactly. But I said, give me five verses that say, in essence, Ye must speak in tongues to be saved. And he said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, there's not five verses in the Bible that say that. Well, I'm glad he knew his Bible that much. I said, no problem. I said, "Um, give me one verse that says, in essence, ye must speak in tongues to be saved. He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, "Uh, there's not one verse. I said, man, is your God stupid? Oh, man, he liked to fell off his ladder. He said, what? I said, your God is stupid. He said, why do you say that? I said, because the only way to get to heaven is to trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and have the initiative of speaking in tongues, right? He said, right. I said, okay, you know that, and now I know that. And I said, your stupid God couldn't put that one time clearly in the Bible. And then I quoted five verses that salvation was by grace alone. Let me ask you something. If somebody knocked on your door tomorrow, could you give them five verses that show that salvation is by grace? It's not by church membership. It's not by good works. It's not by baptism. It's not by citizenship. It's not by anything else. If you couldn't give them five verses that salvation was by grace, why not? You cross that line, will you? Get over there and study some Bible. Could you show somebody five verses why after they're saved they ought to be baptized by immersion in water? You say, are there five in there? I ain't telling you. I wouldn't show you those five verses right now if my life depended on it or if your life depended on it. You know why? You need to find them yourself. Guys, don't draw a line between just being a Bible believer and then learning that book a little bit. Don't draw a line between claiming Jesus Christ and telling people about him. You know, when I got saved, I was Roman Catholic and I told you I was a drunk and, and, uh, and they sent me this letter. Uh, send me this letter after I got saved, church I got saved in. And, and, and here's what it said. 
It said, now that you're a Christian, there's three things. It, it said, God is your father. And it said, there's three things you ought to do every day. First off, you ought to talk to your father every day. Don't you think that makes good sense? Amen. And he said, you talk to your father every day by prayer. I said, well, that sounds good. He said, then the second one is, uh, if you talk to your father, don't you want him to talk back? I mean, you don't say, hey, dad, uh, what do you want me to do? And then walk out of the room. <laughs> you wait for the answer. And he said, so let God talk to you every day by reading the Bible. And he said, the third thing you do is you witness. You know what? I've witnessed everybody in this room about my father. Now, you guys don't know a lot about my father, but you know one thing for sure. You know what it is? Last name's Gip. When I say my name's Sam Gip, I am testifying about my father. Isn't that true? And it said you ought to witness every day. And I thought, boy, that's some good news. Now, here's what happened. I, um, I, let me tell you about the first gospel track that I ever passed. I got, uh, I got gospel tracks on me all the time. I think you ought to always have gospel tracks on you. You know, uh, I told you, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're Americans, we're Baptists, and we like things that are free, except tracks. And we will walk in church past the track rack with no tracks on us, walk out of the church past the track rack with no tracks on us, and then that week, we'll talk to somebody and go, man, I wish I had a track. Well, whose fault's that? You're the one that walked past it not once, but twice. And they're free. So um, the first track I ever passed, and I'd just gotten saved. And I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't sure exactly what to do to lead somebody to Christ. But the first track I passed, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a little track like this. It was, you've seen it, the, the classic gray and pink Simple Plan of Salvation, God's Simple Plan of Salvation track. Uh, I was 20 years old. I gave that to a fella, uh, Italian Roman Catholic by the name of Louis Brio. I went to St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church. Louis lived right in the same street as I did, just across 6th Street. Lived on the corner. Louis was about uh, 21 years old. He's about six foot three, six foot four, about 250 pounds. Louis went to St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church. I gave Louis that track. Well, then right across the street from Louis was a guy named Tony Ramos, Spanish Roman Catholic. So went to St. Joe's Roman Catholic Church, same one that me and Louis went to. And one day, Tony wanted me to witness to him. Tony Ramos wanted me to tell him about Jesus Christ. I knew he did. You know how I knew? Because he was pretending to work on the radio in his car, and I'm, I'm sure that, I'm sure what he was really hoping was I'd come by and witness to him. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to let him down. So, uh, so I started witnessing to Tony. Well, I'm sitting here talking to Tony about the Lord, and I notice Louis walks out, he sees this, and he walks out of his house, and he comes out there, and he stands on the street, uh, on, the court, on the curb like this. And he's looking at me, I'm thinking, this is not good. Let's talk about anything. So, uh, so we're talking. Now, when you, when, you, when you carry on a witness with somebody, you've got to know when to stop. You've got to be led of the Spirit, know when to stop. I knew exactly when to stop witnessing to Tony. It was right after he said, get out of here, don't talk to him anymore. That was a pretty good opportunity to stop. So I stopped, and when I stopped, Louis across the street goes like this. And I went, So I walked across there, prepared to meet, to meet my God. And Louis said, uh, he said, hey, Sam. He said, you know that little pamphlet you gave me the other day, a couple weeks ago? I said, yeah. He said, if I was up in my room and I read that, he said, there was a prayer in the back of that. He said, if I read that in my room and I got down on my knees by my bed and I prayed that prayer and I meant it, am I saved? I said, Louis, did you do that? He said, I sure did. I said, Louis, you're saved. Now, guys, I don't believe that everybody gets saved just repeating a prayer. It's not one, two, three, repeat after me, five, six, seven, now you're going to heaven, eight, nine, ten, let's do it again. I know I forgot four, let's go get some more. But some people got saved by reading a gospel track. You know what I didn't notice? What I did not know as I spoke to Louis that day? I did not know that I wouldn't see him again for 14 years. 14 years later. Uh, I was on the staff of the Masson Baptist Temple, a church of about 2,000 people. I went to visitation night one night. They handed me a pack of three-by-five cards, and the top card was Louis Brio. I thought, whoa. I, it was a different address. He'd moved. And I said, i got to go see Louis. Now, guys, I believe Louis got saved, but you know there's a chance he didn't. And so I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to say, I know you're saved because you prayed that day. I'm not going to say that. So I'm sitting in his living room, and I said, Lou, I said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you'd go to heaven? He goes, I do, Sam. I said, why? Here's what he said. You're not going to remember this, but, and gave me that same testimony almost word for word 
of how he read that track up in his bedroom, got on his knees and trusted Christ like he had 14 years old. Hey, guys, Louis Brio got saved. Amen. That was the first gospel track I ever passed. Now, I don't count them. You know, I know guys say, we counted, we passed 5,000 tracks, we passed 1,000 or 10,000. I never count them. I don't know. I only know this. I've been passing those for 43 years. Are you ready for this? Louis got saved on the first track I passed. In 43 years, I've never got the second testimony of anybody getting saved. You say, are you saying nobody else got saved from a gospel track you passed? I didn't say that at all. I said, I never got the testimony. You know what I'm not? I'm not a farmer. I'm not, my father-in-law was a farmer. He's a good man. I'm not a farmer. But tell me something. If I went across this uh, country and I had, a, uh, I had a bag of seed corn over my shoulder and I just went out across fields and I just slung that corn out like that, it wouldn't all come up, would it? But some would, wouldn't it? Now, it wouldn't be those nice straight rows that a professional farmer gets. It wouldn't be that nice high yield that they've cultivated and, and they've fertilized and they've weeded. But something would come up, wouldn't it? Well, guys, if I just go out and for 43 years, I just sling that seed. It's got to come up somewhere. You ever seen a, a, a rogue stalk of corn in a bean field? I was there. <laughs> that was one of my converts, guys. Now, you know what happens? I go to places I've never been. People I've never met. They come up and they go, uh, I heard you preach or heard a sermon on the internet or got a, I got a tape or a, or a disc uh, and something you preached helped me. I understand that. Or they'll say, I read one of your books and that helped me. I understand that. But when I get on the other side, you know what God did? First time I passed a tract, He let me know this is good seed. And He's never told me another thing about that seed, but I got the lesson the first time. And when I get to heaven, I get to find out where all of that went. And I'm going to find out something about my life, not my ministry, but my life that I don't know anything about. I'll tell you this now, move on. I was coming up from uh, first year Bible college. That was back in the days, you know, when they pumped your gas. And uh, I pulled this gas station and this guy pumped my gas. And, and I give him a, 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 I paid him and I gave him a track. Now, I'm not talking about there was no sin in my life. I was not backslidden. But did you ever have those times in your life when you're just cold? Just, you know, you're just, just cold. And, and that's where I was. That, that was just kind of cold with the Lord. And so um, I, I gave, gave this guy some money. And then before I pulled out of his gas station, I gave him a gospel track. And I'm headed this way. I got to go this way. So I pulled out of that, ga that, that gas station. Uh, and I turned to go back that way. And I mean, I, I got about right beside where I'd just been. I didn't go 100 yards. And the devil got in my truck. And he sat down right beside me. You know what he said? He said, if that guy back there knew how cold you are spiritually right now, he'd take that gospel track and he'd throw it away. And I thought, boy, that is the truth. And just about that time, the Holy Spirit reached in that truck and grabbed the devil by the collar, yanked him out that window, threw him alongside the highway, sat down beside me, and he said this. He said, but nothing about you rubs off on that paper. Now, don't try this, okay? You could have just killed somebody and passed a gospel track. God still blessed the word. I mean, he said, my word shall not return unto me void. Isn't that right? Amen. Guys, you can be backslidden. You can be mad at God. It doesn't matter. You could have just had a fight with your husband or your wife. You could be mad at your parents and pass a gospel track and get on the other side and find out that it took. So, so don't draw a line between you and putting out the tracks. I get people to say this, well, preacher... I'm just not good at talking to people. Then don't. I'm not going to call you a coward. I know I'm supposed to call you a coward. Oh, you coward. You don't care about souls. No, no, listen. If you're afraid to talk to people, then, then don't talk to people. Then ask God for innovative ways to put these out anyway. Leave them in a restaurant. Hey, you know a good place to put tracks? The track delivery slot on a car. You know where that is. Guy pulls into a Kmart or Walmart and it's in the middle of summer, and he, he so wants somebody to give him a gospel track, but he's got to go in the store, so he leaves his car window down that much so they can put it in the window. Well, don't break that guy's heart. 
Wouldn't it be something, guys, get up to heaven and you're talking to some guy and say, how'd you get saved? Say, well, you're not, you don't believe this. I was going through this little town near Denver, uh, Aurora, I believe it was. And I pulled in this uh, Walmart uh, and left my window down that much. When it came out, uh, there was a little gospel pamphlet on the seat and I read that and I got saved. And you say, were you driving a blue Taurus? <laughs> Guys, don't draw a line between you and doing something for God. Amen. Now I want you to go to the second point. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. You know the story here. Daniel's a captive. Uh, I say it this way. Daniel is not home he is in Babylon, and, and he is there under protest. Wouldn't you say that's a good way to say it? He's there against his will, and he's working in the court. Now, now I, am, I am reading this, something into this. You can argue with me if you want, but I'm going to take the stand here. I believe he's already done some things or gone along with some things he wasn't all completely for. Uh, you talk to good men. You talk to good men. You know, we always say everybody in, the, in Congress is a crook. Actually, not everybody. There's probably one good one. <laughs> Really, there might be a good one or two, uh, and you'll find some good things here about them, and then you'll hear that they compromised here, and you go, we see they compromised. Yeah, but you don't understand what they're doing. And so I think Daniel maybe has already gone along with some things that he wasn't too crazy about, and then this happens. Look what it says in verse 8. Uh, and what the king did is the king told him, I want Daniel and all the other guys to eat the food that we eat. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now guys, I never go to Hebrew or Greek to enlighten the text because I don't think you can. But you see, look at verse 8 again. You see where it says uh, he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat? I looked up at that word meat. In Hebrew, it's quiche. I said, boy, God's in that. <laughs> but here's what Daniel did. I think Daniel said, um, you know, I've already gone along with some things I don't agree with. But I'm drawing a line here. I'm just not going any farther. You know, I think there was a day in this country where Christians, where Americans would draw a line and say, I'm not going any farther than this. But we just don't draw any lines anywhere anymore. Let me tell you the generation I come from, and I'm sure there's some here that come from that generation. You know, I was, I was telling somebody, I was listening to this, uh, this child psychologist talking about Generation Y. Now, I thought Generation X was bad, but Y, that's kind of like Generation X with their brains beat out. <laughs> and this guy says, Generation Y is the most inept generation we got. He said, they can't do anything. They can't do anything, especially if the computer's down. But they got the highest self-esteem of any generation we've had. You ready for this? Here's what this guy said. And he said they all believe that there's someday there's going to be a reality TV program about their life. I said, yeah, there was. When I was a kid, it was called the test pattern. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a little prophecy. You ever go by a business and you got a teenage kid with a sign, you know, like income tax here or buy $5 pizza, and he's not holding the sign. He's going... You know, he's flipping it. Don't you go to school to learn what you can do all your life? Yeah. If, if the Lord tarries 15 years, you're going to pull up to the interstate, and the guy that says, $5, home, homeless, please give me something, he's going to be gone. Because the kid grew up, and it's all he learned in school. But um, <coughs> anyway, um, Daniel had, had, I believe he'd gone along with some things that he wasn't in favor of. Now, back when I was a kid, you guys may not understand this, you little kids. But when I was your age, there was no color in the world. <laughs> the whole world was black and white. That's right. I know, I saw it on TV. <laughs> and, and I come from the generation where the, 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 the first cowboy movies, this guy would shoot the guy and he'd go, bam, oh, you got me. And when he pulled his hand down, there was no bullet hole. There was nothing to show that he'd been shot. You had to pretend, you had to imagine that there was a bullet hole. Now, I had a good imagination. I saw the guy drop. And then somebody in Hollywood said this. If you take a little magic marker and put a little spot there, and the guy goes, oh, you got me? He takes his hand down. They'll see a bullet hole. 
And so here, this was the beginning of special effects. So this guy draws a little spot there, uh, and the guy goes, oh, you got me. And when he pulled his hand down, I'm, oh, I could even see the bullet hole. <laughs> and I came right along with Hollywood, guys. I really did. And then somebody said, you know, if you put a little ketchup pack right underneath that bullet hole, the guy goes, oh, you got me. He'll see the red, and they'll think it's blood. And so I'm watching one day, and the guy gets shot, and he goes, oh, you got me. And sure enough, man, he took his hand down. He went, you could even see the blood. Hollywood took a step. I took the step. They took the step. I took the step. They took the step. I went right along with them. Then somebody in Hollywood came up with the idea of the exit wound. That's a sick dude. But I kind of grew used to it. Man, you know, little in, big out. And so now you saw, you know, like uh, this big hole in the guy's back. And I go, man, that was so realistic. Hollywood took a step. I took a step. Then they started getting this thing where, you know, it wasn't good unless you saw the guy's brain splatter on the wall behind him. I go, man, that's really something. You know, I did... Every time Hollywood took a step, I took a step. Every time they did it, I went right with them. Till they got to the point somewhere where everybody had to eat each other's heads off. Amen. Where they had to rip people to shreds and leave their body parts hanging in trees. Now, I'm a guy, all right? And I like man movies. Now, when I say man movies, you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about these pornographic films. I'm talking about something goes fast, makes noise, and blows up and kills somebody. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I'm sorry, ladies, ladies. If the name of the movie or the book was Little Women Go Down and Shoot Up the Mall, I might read it. <laughs> if it is Anne is sniping from her nest in the Green Gable, that would turn my head. But those two, mo those two books don't do anything for me, all right? But here's the thing. Uh, one time, and, and we, we don't do a lot. We don't go to movies, my wife and I. But everybody sees them. Everybody sees them. Well, first off, there's this one where I think somebody in Hollywood says, let's see how many times we can get those Christians let us say this word in their living room. And they say it and say it and say it. And it vexes your righteous soul, but you hang right in there. Isn't that true? My, shame on us. And then they say, let's see how much gore we can foist on this crowd. And we were wondering what it was. But man, over all these years, every time Hollywood took the step, I took the step. And they took the step, and I took the step. And they took the step. And I'm out here, and Hollywood took this step here. And I took a look at that step. And I walked over at my wife, and I said, you know something, Kathy? Guy movies have passed me by. And I turned it off. You say, oh, you drew a line, and you wouldn't go any farther? No, I didn't. You know what I did? I took several steps back. Because I, I realized, when I realized how much farther they wanted me to go, I thought, what's next? We are allowing in our living rooms things that we wouldn't have talked about in, in a gutter 25 years ago. Isn't that right? I mean, we've been ashamed to mention them. You, you know, I, it, it so breaks my heart that I hear young girls today got worse language than the drunks had when I was lost 40 years ago. You say, what was that TV? You know what I'm going to tell you something, guys? Let me ask you a question. Where are you going to draw the line? You're going to have to draw the line somewhere, all right? Where are you going to draw the line? You know, I just realized when I, that they've been leading me by the eyes. They had my eyes, and they just kept bringing me along, bringing me along. And I finally saw this, and I said, you know something? They want me to go farther than I want to go. And then I took a look at what I was looking at, and I thought, well, you know, this ain't too cool. So I just took a step back. Guys, here's what I'm going to tell you. I may die watching black and white reruns of Bonanza, okay? Really? But I've already, I've already allowed too much. I've already gone farther than I should have gone. But I'm just not going any far. Could I, could I speak to the men? Now, now, men, you need to answer this question someplace. You need to get to the bottom of this. Let me ask you a question. Who addicted us to blood? Who convinced us that if we don't see at least two murders per hour, because your favorite cop program, they kill at least two people per hour. Whoever, who convinced us if we haven't seen two murders per hour, we haven't been entertained? Man, I remember when they wouldn't even show you a dead body. They'd have it covered with a sheet. Now, you got to see the guy, he's burned, he's curled up, his mouth is hanging open. you got to watch the guy with the, in the, doing the autopsy, holding the guy's lung in one hand and his heart in another. 
And we're not happy unless we have seen blood. Who addicted us to murder? Who told us? Who convinced us that if I can see murder, if I can see mayhem, if I can see grief, hey, could I ask you a question? When did rape become entertaining? When did you say, boy, that's, now that's a, way to, that's a way to top off a nice family night at home. You know what I think? I'm not cutting you down. You know what I'm telling you? I think everybody in here, I'll bet you you have all done the same thing I've done. We all say this. Don't we all say this? Well, you know, they say you put a frog in water, and you turn it up one degree at a time, and you'll, you'll boil him alive, and he won't notice because you're doing it one degree at a time. And you know what kills me is while we're saying that, they've been turning the water up on us one degree at a time. I mean, we're allowing stuff in our living rooms that, 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 was, that wasn't allowed in bars 30 years ago. Isn't that right? All I'm asking you is, we're going to draw the line. You're going to have to draw the line somewhere. Where are you going to draw the line? You say, so you think I ought to go home and throw away my DVDs? I think you ought to do worse than that. You ready for this? I think you ought to go home and watch them. Yeah. Yeah, I think you ought to go watch everything you've got. In fact, tell you what you do. Pop an extra bowl of popcorn and put it on the couch beside you and invite Jesus to watch this with you. You know what I hope God does? I, listen, I don't want you to throw your stuff away. I want you to see what's there. And I hope the next time you watch something, I hope God opens your eyes until you're looking at it and you're going, what on earth am I calling entertainment? How on earth did I get to the point where I'm allowing this, where I'm letting this, where I call this, that this has entertained me? Who did this to me? Who addicted us to blood? I'm going to tell you who didn't do it. You church members, it wasn't your preacher. You bad mouth pastors, they do this, they do that. Listen, it wasn't no preacher ever told you that if you didn't see somebody murdered or raped or beaten or stabbed or drugged by a car or some other godless thing that they do. Would you look at the advertisement for the new stuff on TV? It's all horror. It's all demoniac. It's all, it's all menacing. It's all dark. It's all evil. And you're going, I can't wait to see it. Who did that to you? I don't care if you figure out who it was. Just let me tell you this. It wasn't your friend. Where are you going to draw the line? Where are you going to draw the line? Amen. Hey, uh, where do you draw the line? You know, I never, I never thought this would happen. I'm, I'm just amazed at the transformation of my country. I told you, I, uh, I, I do some email, and <laughs> uh, to get to my, uh, to my email, I've got to go through MSN. That's what they call the home page. And so there's always about three or four things. And now, you know, I'll go through there because I want to see what the... Uh, you know, what the, what, if there's a news story or something I want to watch. And you know what I see? Ten ways to flirt. What? Ten great lines to pick somebody up and score. Good night. What, is, what has happened to our country? Hey, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line between flirting and adultery? Well, you know, I'm just flirting a little bit. I'd never do anything wrong. Yeah, but where are you going to draw the line? I... If the wares ain't for sale, why you got them displayed? Yeah, amen. And what do you do in trying to make somebody think? I can't get over it, you know. Uh, you just want somebody to talk to? Yeah, after 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what are you doing? Where are you going to draw the line? That's good, you think, well, as long as we didn't do anything, what are you doing flirting? Right. Amen. Why do you think that is good? Well, that's just sporting. What changes sport? Do tiddlywinks. Play checkers, pal. It's not as deadly. It won't destroy your marriage. Where are you going to draw the line? Hey, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line, you, you, you accept gossip, but not murder? Now, let me say this. I am so glad that I'm a Baptist. You know why I'm glad I'm a Baptist? Because Baptists do not gossip. Baptists don't gossip. Anybody hear gossips? See? Nobody's raising a hand. <laughs> Baptists don't gossip. But Baptists can spread killer prayer requests. You know, a Baptist can split a church with a prayer request. Pray for our pastor. You know, he's been here 17 years now. And, and today he used an illustration he used 17 years ago. And God's probably done with him here, but he doesn't know it yet. Well, you have somebody over for dinner and go, now, you know, we really love our pastor. You know, there's just a few things that, that we're concerned about. <laughs> let, me how, let me tell you how I view gossip, okay? You're upset with your pastor. And so one night about 11 o'clock, you go, uh, you seen that new picture window he has down in his house? 
So you take your old 12 gauge Mossberg pump and you put three rounds of, uh, in it and you go down there about 11 o'clock at night uh, and there's that great big old pitcher window your pastor just put in and you go, watch this. Boom! Man, you just blow that glass all over his living room. And you're just about to pull away and you go, wait, I still got two shots and look at that ornate front door. All that stained glass and perfect carved wood. Watch this and boom! Man, you put a deer round right through that thing. As you're about to pull away, you go, whoa, that window's not as big as the, as the picture window, but that's still a pretty nice one. I still got one round. Boom! And you blow the way. As you're driving away, you go, boy, he'll know I was here now. He'll know somebody doesn't like what's going on there. And then you pick up tomorrow's paper, and you read when you blew that picture window, you got his wife holding their baby granddaughter, and you killed them both. That when you hit that door, you got him because he was walking in there to find out what just happened. And when you went through that window, you got his eight-year-old granddaughter come down the steps to see what happened to Grandma. You wreak havoc and death. You know what you'd say if you found that out? I'll tell you what all of you would say. Well, I didn't mean to kill anybody. No, you didn't want to kill anybody. You just want to blow holes in front of his house. I'm amazed at how many people, they don't want to kill anybody, but boy, they'll sure rake them over the coals. I was talking to a man one time when I was pastoring. Now, this guy didn't go to my church. He's not a bad man. He wasn't a bad man. He's just a typical Christian. He lived many, many miles from me. He went to a church where the pastor used the NIV. This guy believed the King James Bible. Let me tell you this. That man is right about the Bible, and his pastor's wrong. But he's, uh, you know, we're out of my parsonage where I'm living. And, and he's, he's going up one side of his preacher and down the other. Because, see, he thinks this. Because his pastor's wrong about the NIV, then I'm going to just jump on his pastor about everything. And I'm not jumping on anything. Oh, and you know, uh, we needed this in the church, but the pastor wanted a brand new piano. So we ended up getting a piano instead of what we needed, you know. Now look, guys, I've been at this long enough to know there's three sides to every story. Her side, his side, and the truth. <laughs> so I'm not getting the pastor's side. And if I did, I'd still know that the truth was somewhere between what he said and what this guy said. But this guy's bad-mouthing his pastor, and I'm not getting on board. And he notices that I'm not jumping on. And so he finally says this, and you know, he spends a lot of time in that church alone with the church secretary. And I said, wait just a second. I said, are you right now accusing your pastor of committing adultery with the church secretary? And you know what he said? He said this just so innocently. He goes, I didn't say that. Well, he didn't, did he? But uh, what did you all think when I said that? Right. You thought the same thing I thought. And I said, no, you didn't. But I said, the way you said that, I said, that's exactly what you implied, isn't it? Right. Well, yeah. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you believe, I want to know, because maybe, hey guys, maybe his pastor's committing adultery with the church secretary. And I said, do you believe that your pastor's committing adultery with the church secretary? Now, he doesn't know. I don't know his pastor. I've never met his pastor. He doesn't know what I'm going to do. Gauge by what he, what he answers. And I said, do you believe that your pastor's committing adultery with the church secretary? He goes, No. I said that don't you ever say anything like that about him or any other preacher ever again. I said, you just offhandedly, flippantly said something that made it look like your pastor's committing adultery. And I said, what happens to his whole reputation gets destroyed because you think I'm going to take it out there? What if I did? Right. Now, here's what he didn't know. When I asked him, do you believe your pastor's committing adultery with the church secretary? If he said yes, uh -huh. I was going to say, come in the house. Uh -huh. Give me your pastor's phone number. You say, you're going to tell on him? No. No, I was going to tell him. You know what I was going to do? I was going to call up his pastor and say, hey, Pastor, this is Sam Gipp. I pastor of First Baptist, or, uh, Freedom Baptist Church in Auburn, New York. Are you committing adultery with the church secretary? <laughs> well, I want to know. And if he said, uh, no, I'm certainly not. I said, well, here, here's one of your church members. He sure thinks you are. <laughs> you say, you'd do that in a heartbeat. Yep. You'd do that to a King James guy, to an NIV pastor, in a heartbeat. You know why? Because you know what the unpardonable sin, you know what the sin unto death is? Let me tell you what the sin unto death is. To disagree with me. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't mean to disagree with Sam Gipp. We all believe the sin unto death is disagree with us. You think anybody disagrees with you, it's open season. If you don't like them, 
Uh, if they made you mad, you think you got a right to chew up one side of them and down the other uh, and destroy them. Man, there's these two sisters. They're talking about a third sister. They're talking on the phone, and this one girl, man, she is talking about this other girl, and she goes, oh, tell me more. So for about another 10 minutes, man, she just waxes eloquent. She just rips her. Oh, tell me more. Another five minutes, man, she's just up hip and thigh. One, one thing after this, she goes, oh, tell me more. She goes, I can't, dear. I've already told you more than I heard. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, guys. Where you draw the line? Where you draw the line? Hey, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. You believe in villains? I believe in villains. I believe in villains. I mean, somebody's got to be in Congress. But um, you know, I, I like them villains where where the where the good guy wore the white hat, the bad guy wore the black hat. Not only did the bad guy die at the end, but here's the most important thing: he repented before he died. Have you noticed that we got a whole generation that kills people and everybody goes, why, there's no remorse. How could there be remorse? You look at a movie today and the bad guy dies snarling at the good guy. He never repents. The only guy that is true to his cause is the villain. Because the good guy, hey, I told you, he's taken a bribe or he did something against the law. Your hero, your good guy, he's, he's flawed. The only guy that's real loyal, really loyal to his, his position is the bad guy, the villain. And so, but I believe in villains. Okay, so I accept villains. I accept villains. Let me ask you this. You accept witches? You accept witches? I mean, even if they're cute, wiggle their nose, you know, when they just do little cute things. I was talking to a Christian. They said, they're going to go see this movie about a witch. I said, you're going to a movie about a witch? And they said, they said yeah, but it, she's a good witch. I said, oh, you mean she's a dead witch? She goes, no. I said, well, the Bible says thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So I said, if she's a good witch, she's a dead witch. If she's not a dead witch, she's not a good witch. Well, yeah, but she does white magic. She doesn't do black magic. Hey, guys, a witch is a witch. And some of you, you accept, that's right, that's right. You accept sorcerers. If they're cute little kids riding around on a broom. And I, I know, I know the, the storyline. I don't watch that stuff. But I know the storyline. You know what the storyline always is? The good witch is fighting the forces of evil of the bad witches, and the good sorcerer is fighting the, the forces of the bad sorcerer. You know, they got a movie out there. I've never seen it. It's one of them or two of them or a whole series of them where the hero is a son of the devil. And he's even got his horns cropped off just to show you he means no harm. And he's just a great, big, red, nice guy. Hey. And I'll guarantee you, you watch that movie. I've never seen that movie. I don't want to see that movie. You watch that movie, and I'll guarantee you that the son of the devil is a good guy. And that somewhere in that movie, he is in trouble and about to get killed, and you, the Christian, find yourself hoping that the devil's son comes out okay. When I think that happens, I think, boy, they got you, didn't they? That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. You, got your, you, want, you want to take your villain? You want to take your witch? And you want to take your, your, your sorcerer? But now listen to me carefully, okay? Listen very carefully. You accept villains? That's fine. You would accept witches? That's fine. You would accept sorcerers? That's fine. But if you're entertained by vampires, you're not right with God. You say you're judging in a heartbeat. You better believe I'm judging. Could I ask you a question? What is it about somebody sucking somebody else's blood that you put that in the list called entertaining? What is wrong with us that somebody sucking somebody else's blood is our idea of having a good time? I told you, your pastor didn't do that to you. Some evangelist didn't do that to you. Some missionary didn't do that to you. Somebody that you trusted. Somebody that, that you cared about. I'll tell you when I knew this country was doomed. I knew it was doomed two weeks after Barack Obama got elected. Uh, well, I'll tell you why. Because here we had just, for the first time in our life, uh, we, had, we, had, um, we had elected a communist and an and a illegal alien and a, a socialist. And we got this guy. And, and instead of repenting two weeks later, I'm looking at the news, and it's showing a theater. And there's a line of teenage girls. And this line goes all the way down, down the street and around and out of sight. And the news report was this. There's a thousand teenage girls in this line going to this theater to see a romantic vampire movie. I didn't know you could use the word romantic and vampire in the same sentence. But boy, guys, we got it. And now it's happening in our churches. And, it, and now our kids are gone. They're watching the vampire movies. And, and I'm telling you guys, what is it about somebody sucking somebody else's blood? I mean, at least I just want to see them take it and shoot it, man. You guys want to drink it. 
I was, uh, I was in a church back east, and I said that. I said, what is it about somebody sucking somebody's blood that, that you find entertaining? And right after that, uh, I'm standing there back by the book table, and one of the men of the church came up to me. Now, this man that came up to talk to me, he's not a pew warmer. He's a good man. This is one of the most outstanding men in that church. And he goes, oh, brother. He goes, I can't believe you said what you said tonight. I said, why? I said, what I say? He said, well, you said that about vampires. I said, yeah, I heard me. <laughs> he said, well, you won't believe what I did today. I said, what? He said, well, when I was in college, we had to read Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, it was required by my college class to read it. It's a classic. And he said, I just bought a copy today to reread it just to see what it was like. And he said, and then you said that about vampires. And I said, um, so what is it about somebody sucking somebody else's blood that you find entertaining? He goes, but it's a classic. I said, I don't care. Can I ask you a question, guys? Why is it if it's, if, if it's not art, they got their clothes off, if it's not art, it's pornography, but if it's art, it's okay? Right. Yeah. And why is it because it's a classic, you can read about that garbage? And he goes, he goes, but what's wrong with it? And his son is standing right here. And I said, you know what's wrong with it? I said, that boy right there, your son, he doesn't see any difference between his vampires and your vampires. And he says, oh, he's not looking at vampires. I said, that's what you think. And he came back to church the next day and says, you know what I did today? I said, what? He said, I took it back. I said, good. You know why I'm glad? Because he doesn't even know why I bought it. I know why I bought it. He doesn't know why I bought it. Don't you know why I bought it? He is going to read Bram Stoker's Dracula, right? Because it's a classic. Let me tell you what's going to happen. When he got done reading, you know what he's going to say? So how does that compare to Twilight? I'd better read that too, just so I can see. Guys, what are we doing? What are we doing, yo? Uh, I, I heard there's a movie out there. You ready for this? A girl falls in love with the zombie that ate her boyfriend's brain. If that's not a heartwarming romance story, I just don't know what is. I mean, I just get warm and fuzzy thinking about it. <laughs> Guys, can I ask you a question? Who did that? Who did that to you? Boy, you'll beef, you'll complain, you'll gripe about preachers and everything we do. Let me ask you a question. Where are you going to draw the line? You know what some of you ought to do? You all just go out and read everything you got and look at everything you got and watch everything you got and I hope God opens your heart, opens your eyes to it. And then you know what I hope you do? I hope you look over at your wife, your husband, and you say, you know something? Just like Daniel, we've already come a long way. Let's get rid of this stuff. Now let's take a step back here and let's draw a line here. Guys, you're not going to miss anything. You're not going to miss nothing. I want to tell you this, I, uh, these, these fight on books, I read a lot of stories, I read a lot of books looking for stories, and I don't think this book made, the, this particular story made the cut, but the, but the story was intriguing. And what it was, this guy wanted to go up, I think he was up in Alaska, and he wanted to hunt a grizzly bear. And he, he hired a, uh, a native Indian as a outfitter, and what these guys do is they go stake out where the bear is, you know, they get to know the bear's habits and everything, uh, and then they bring a client in, the guy, he says, there's going to be the bear, boom, shoot the bear, and he gets the bear. That's exactly what happened. This Indian, you know, he's got a nice little old hide, he brings his client in, he said now, he said, you see those Adler trees up there? He said, yeah, he said, oh, he said, he said, oh, our maybe 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, he said, uh, there's going to be a big old grizzly bear come out of there, he's going to go right down into those bushes, and he's going to eat them berries, and he's going to give you a perfect broadside shot, and you're going to get you a trophy. Well, about 30 minutes later, just like that bear read the script. Man, he came down to those Adler trees. He went down to those berry bushes. I mean, he's got a dead broadside to that hunter. He's over there eating them berries. He's not even aware those guys are up in that hide. And, and that Indian, you know, gave that guy the nudge. Boy, he put that scope rifle up there, that high pile thing. He put those crosshairs right where that bear's heart was, clicked off the safety, and went... Uh, And he looked over and says, uh, what's the matter? He goes, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to get a little closer. You want to get closer? Yeah, I'd like to get a little closer. Okay. So they, now there's a bear in the woods. All right. So they're real quiet. But they're still downwind. 
And so well, they get a little bit closer, and he says, uh, there he is. Take your shot. This guy, he puts those crosshairs in that bear again. Bears still don't know they're there. He's about to squeeze that round off. He goes, uh, this thing, he goes, what's the matter? He goes, I'd like to get a little closer. You want to get closer? Yeah. All right. So they sneak out of there. And they go around another place. Now they're about 70, off, 70 yards off. And uh, I don't know if you realize it, but a bear running full tilt covers a quarter mile in 15 seconds. And when he gets to the end of that quarter mile, he don't stop. And if you're at the end of that quarter mile, you're going with him. And so this uh, Indian's already gone a whole lot closer to this, this living, breathing bear that he's ever wanted to get, but he's going to try to please a client. So he takes him to this third place, and he goes, uh, okay, take the shot. And he brings that rifle up to his shoulder, puts that crosshairs out on that bear, puts his finger on that, on that trigger, pulls a little tension, he goes, uh, like to get a little closer. You want to get closer? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to shoot him from right over there. And then he goes, uh, right over there? He goes, yeah. Okay. You go. I stay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that Indian was saying? Guys, I've already come farther than I want to go. I didn't want to get this close to this bear, but I ain't getting no closer. I'm drawing a line here. You want to get close to that bear? You go ahead. Guys, you know what I'm going to tell you? I have already gone farther than I ever should have gone. I, I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. Part of it, I was innocent. Part of it, just a man. I wanted to see the blood. I wanted to see the shoot him up. Uh, I wanted the bad guys to lose. But you know, I already went farther than I. Now look, you do anything you want. But wherever you're going to go, you go. I stay. Because I've already gone farther than I want to go. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. In just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer. I'm going to open the invitation. Say, what's the invitation? It's going to be a twofold invitation. Maybe somebody needs to cross a line. The line that keeps you from coming to the special services. The line that keeps you from giving. Maybe sacrificially, maybe even tithing. Maybe it's a line that gets you into this Bible. Maybe it's the line to get you passing gospel tracts and winning some soul to Christ. Maybe tonight you need to cross that line for the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe somebody needs to come down, get, get on your knees and say this to God. God, that thing about blood, that thing about witches and sorcerers and vampires, that thing about murder and rape and, and, and all the, 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 the perversion, I've already gone farther than I should go. I'm just like Daniel. I've already gone too far with my spreading my, spread my prayer requests. I've already gone too far with my flirting. I've already gone farther than I should have gone. But tonight I'm drawing the line. I'm not going any farther. Why don't you do that tonight? Where are you going to draw the line?